Welcome everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the third in our series on uh, brain imaging and neuroscience. Um, we've had two uh, very fascinating talks uh, on our last two weeks. And um, this one looks especially interesting with our sea lion facing us. So we're very much looking forward to that. Uh, Dr. Ben Inglis serves as the manager and physical physicist and principal development engineer of the Henry H. Wheeler Jr. Brain Imaging Center uh, on the Berkeley campus. He has a Bachelor of Science and PhD degrees from the University of London, and he held postdoctoral position and then a scientist position at the University of Florida in Gainesville from 1992 to 2000 before coming to Berkeley in 2001 to join the then new Brain Imaging Center. At the center, he's the key person supporting not only researchers in over 40 different labs across the campus who are pursuing basic and clinical brain research, but also clinicians and scientists beyond the uh, campus and even beyond the state. Dr. Inglis in provides scientific input on method developments aimed specifically at the problems presented by users' research goals. He also trains new users to operate the BI, uh, the center's scanners independently. In his additional role as the scientific director of the Wheeler Laboratory for Advanced Brain Sciences, uh, he works to develop new clinical applications for magnetic resonance and other non-invasive methods in the study of physiology and biochemistry of the brain. Uh, He's already been in the past two decades uh, at the center involved in uh, discoveries and uh, new developments in how this uh, technology is used. So I'm delighted to welcome him here to present the final finale in our, our series. Uh, and his title is Learning um, Sardines, Sea Lions and Surgery. Uh, you can see the rest of it on the screen, the subtitle. So I'll turn it over to Ben right now and thank him once again for uh, talking to us. Cool. Thanks, Donald. <clears throat> Thanks for Mark for uh, for inviting me. This is uh, an unusual topic, I think. Um, it's unusual for me. Um, and uh, so we're going to do a lot of different science today. We're going to hit a lot of different areas. There'll be some ecology, some neuroscience, maybe some neurochemistry, and some marine mammal biology. And uh, I'll do my best at the end to answer your questions. So obviously, post anything you like. But bear in mind, my expertise is in the MRI realm. Uh, if I'm unable to answer your questions online, I'll try getting the appropriate answers from the experts on the team. This is a big team effort. Um, at last count, I think about 20 to maybe 30 people are involved, depending on how you slice it. So anyway, um, here goes. Uh, so oh, oh, they use the cursor here. Right. So this, uh, this article appeared in the New York Times last October. Hopefully some of you saw it. It made a bit of a splash. Um, it was a big deal. I mean, it still is a big deal. Uh, I think it made the uh, New York Times uh, weekend section as well for the top 10 uh, things to look at that week. And uh, it's about this little fellow here on the right called Cronut. And this is his story. Uh, he was the first higher mammal, which basically means anything bigger than a rodent, to receive a brand new pioneering uh, form of neurosurgery, which uh, we'll go into later on. Um, and so this is what it looked like at the time. This was one of the photos from the article. You see two neurosurgeons in the foreground. These are residents in Eddie Chang's group at UCSF, um, uh, Ryan Kachansky and John Andrews, who enthusiastically volunteered to do this procedure in a veterinary practice in Redwood City, where they normally would be uh, in UCSF with all their medical instruments. This was a an alien environment for them, but they, they enthusiastically jumped at the chance. In the background, you see Mariana Casalia. She's a postdoc in Scott Baraban's lab at UCSF. He has a joint appointment at UC Berkeley in the Helen Wills Neuroscience Institute. And Mariana joined Scott's lab specifically with the intention of devising a cell line that could be used for this surgery in higher mammals. So these, pig, these are pig uh, fetal cells being injected into Cronut's brain. And she joined uh, Scott with the, with the idea of developing something that could be used translationally. Probably not for sea lions uh, in the first instance, but with pig cells having similar properties to humans that she was, that's what she was particularly interested in. And it was a remarkably prescient uh, piece of research on her part. She had even uh, in discussions with a manufacturer uh, devised the size of needle that would be needed to do this surgery on a sea lion and had one available when the call came. So this entire uh, saga, the, the surgery aspect of it, came together in three weeks. 
uh, in uh, September and early October of last year. And I think, honestly, if you'd ask anybody associated with this project as late as August, if this was likely to have been done, um, then we would have said, yeah, sure, in maybe five or 10 years. Of course, uh, as it turned out, it was done in three weeks. Often that's the way. Um, this is really Cronut's story. Uh, Cronut's a seven-year-old California sea lion, but why him specifically? What made him the candidate to end up on the theater in Redwood City? And uh, why indeed, why sea lions? Why, why was uh, a sea lion considered to be a good candidate for this surgery? Um, so this is the story. Uh, I'm gonna use Cronut as our sort of narrator. And we're gonna follow his history uh, and, and use that as a way to understand the bigger picture. So as far as we are concerned as humans, uh, Cronut first interacted with us in November, 2017 as a, an approximately four year old animal. There's some ambiguity on age, um, but I'm gonna use the latest estimate. So he was approximately four. So he was born in um, the early summer of 2013. He stranded on a beach in San Luis Obispo, not that far from where sea lions go to breed in the Channel Islands. Um, and he was found in a parking lot themed a traffic hazard by the police and was uh, the, the uh, Marine Mammal Center was contacted and he was transported there for, for treatment. Now, um, there's a lovely trend, uh, tradition in the marine mammal uh, community that the rescuing team gets to name the, the rescued animal. And they thought he looked a little bit like a cronut. He, uh, he stranded overweight, pretty unusual for a wild animal to come ashore overweight, especially for a sea lion. They tend to come, out, come ashore uh, often emaciated in very, very poor condition, not so much cronut. Uh, he was the exact opposite. But he has an interesting sort of uh, color scheme and he does definitely resemble a cronut. Um, two T's for the animal cronut and one T for the, for the baked good. But uh, I think that the resemblance is, is pretty apt. He was well named. So he was re rehabilitated by the Marine Mammal Center in Sausalito and then released at, uh, I think it was Rodeo Beach in the Marine Headlands uh, in, at the end of, uh, of November, uh, 2017. Unfortunately, uh, he, came ashore at Stinson Beach, was spotted climbing on people's tables and making a nuisance of himself on people's decks. Uh, and so uh, Marine Mammal Center was called, but uh, Cronut took himself off up, back out to sea before anybody could get to him. Then uh, a week or so later, he was spotted on Ocean Beach in San Francisco. A member of the public apparently tried to feed him a burrito, uh, which luckily he refused. I don't think they're particularly uh, good for, for sea lions. And again, he took himself off back to sea before Marine Mammal Center rescuers could get to him. And then this happened. On the 8th of January, 2018, the TMMC received a frantic call from a member of the public desperate to go to the toilet and was unable to do so because a sea lion was blocking the entrance to the restroom at Duran Beach over on Bodega Bay. So you guessed it, when the rescuers arrived, this is who they found, here's our hero, looking still decidedly chunky and regal uh, and in the rain uh, being kept out of the of the restroom here with a with a trash can and a, and a volunteer with a with a crowding board and you see now the uh, orange tag in his flipper from the first rescue so at this point um, TMMC has a decision to make because uh, he's now stranded three times this will be his fourth time he's overweight but when he comes ashore he's now received refusing to eat now my personal non-medical opinion, not an expert, is Cronut is guilty of malingering. I think he was trying to crack the system. And anybody who has a cat at home knows how ridiculously easy it is to train humans. We're, we're quite easily trained by animals. Um, and I think that Cronut probably had a clever plan in mind. And I think he thought that this, uh, this high living at the TMMC where there's no sharks and they bring the food to you, that seemed pretty good to him. Uh, so I think he tried to, to crack this system. Having stranded already three times with no overt medical problems, but clearly after having created some issues on people's decks and on beaches, the Marine Mammal Center rescuers were worried that at some point, some sort of harm would come to him. Either somebody would do him harm because he was making a nuisance of himself, or he would succumb to some uh, force of nature, some accident uh, uh, in naturally. So he was clearly not thriving in the wild. So they put the call out and um, luckily uh, the, the Six Flags Discovery Kingdom was looking for an animal 
or they were prepared to accept an animal. This is the Six Flags Park over at Vallejo. Um, now there's one other uh, check that they wanted to do before adopting him. That was to get an MRI scan of his brain so that they could check for a neurotoxin called demoic acid, a particular form of brain injury, which is gonna form the bulk of the rest of this story. So uh, this scan was done in Redwood City at the Animal Scan Facility uh, on the 20th of January, 2018. I went down to see this scan, not because it was Cronut. I didn't know Cronut from a bar of soap at this point, um, but specifically because uh, Cronut's veterinary carer, who was Vanessa Horde at the time, uh, she was the Six Flags veterinary uh, person in charge of marine mammals. And she and another uh, couple of collaborators and I were discussing the possibility of studying a development in a longitudinal study of sea lions, sea lion pups, starting at six months, going to four years of, of age. So it just so happened that this scan came up uh, and uh, I heard about it. So I got permission from the Marine Mammal Center folks to go down and observe. I just went and observed. So here you see it as a canonical sea lion with a slice depicting where this image is taken from, the two images. These are the same slice, but with slightly different contrast through this through Cronut's brain. Um, the left image you see is essentially water density. This is the concentration of water at any point in the tissue, with the exception of these black dots that you see in a few places. Those are blood vessels. We don't we don't pick those signals up in this particular scan because the blood is moving too fast. Otherwise, the uh, this is essentially the, the water density. On the right. This is the really the clinically useful scan. This is designed to detect cellular edema or swelling of tissue, okay? So uh, these two together were really the primary interest uh, of the scan that the Marine Mammal Center folks needed to do in order to understand if Cronut could be adopted. The specific structures they're looking at are right here. They're these S or reverse S shaped uh, structures called the hippocampi, or hippo the two hippocampuses left and right. Um, and these are the structures in your brain in the temporal lobe that are responsible for spatial navigation and spatial working memory. So they, the, these are the structures that are important if you want to remember the route to work or if you're in a sea lion, where you go to catch fish, where you've left your pup, that sort of thing. So this is how you encode information about your spatial domain in the world. Um, these are, to me, on the, the, left, the image on the left, it looks a little bit like a an old lady with a big bouffant hairdo now wearing spectacles. Um, the, the key take home here is that there's no gross abnormality. There are no tumors, there's no injury, uh, no uh, obvious uh, cell damage. And importantly, these two structures are symmetric. They're uh, essentially identical mirror images of each other. No gross abnormalities, no subtle abnormalities. So this was good news for Krona uh, because it meant he was uh, thus being a doctor uh, a candidate for adoption by Six Flags. So the, this was by now the end of January, going into February. So uh, Cronut uh, had um, passed all of the, the, the tests and now uh, the paperwork went through for, for him to go and live forever in, uh, in Six Flags at, uh, at Vallejo. So let's see if this works. Hang on. So. Yahoo! That's how I imagine it. Cronut treated it at the time. So uh, life is good. Uh, so all is good for Cronut. Um, he had to have a neutering surgery as a condition of the therapy of the uh, adoption so that they don't have any oops babies in, uh, in captivity. I guess uh, Cronut didn't think every aspect of his plan through. In any case, uh, the paperwork went through uh, and uh, the neutering surgery happened in early May. Uh, and unfortunately though, at the end of May, while recovering from this neutering surgery, from the anesthesia, Cronut had an, an observed seizure. Now what I mean by an observed seizure is he could have had others, but he's not monitored 24 seven. So this is the first time a human had observed him having, a diff having some difficulty. He may have had other seizures uh, that led to his stranding, we'll never know. Um, he then had another seizure in September 8, 2018. So by this point, Vanessa Horde at Six Flags has got Cronut on um, on a seizure medication regimen for essentially for epilepsy. So what does a seizure look like in a sea lion? Uh, well, it's a little disturbing if I click play here, this poor little fellow's on a beach in Washington having a, um, a um, tonic clonic seizure. They, 
they have varying degrees of seizure. Uh, sometimes it's just a bobbing head weaving motion. Sometimes they'll lean all the way over backwards and put their head all the way on their back. Um, but the marine mammal biologists and the, the marine, mammal, marine mammal veterinary care staff are very uh, in tune to abnormal behavior in these sea lions and they know how to score these, these kinds of seizures. So this is the kind of behavior that, um, that Cronut was experiencing. So through September 2018, um, Vanessa, who is now in the dark gray uh, sweat, sweatshirt, uh, sweatshirt right here in the, in the photo, she called me and said, um, look, you know, we were planning on this um, longitudinal study anyway. Cronut needs a scan again. How about we use him as a uh, test case at Berkeley? So great, okay, this is, this is awesome. He's a bit bigger than a six month old pup, but um, let's do it. So this was our first time doing a sea lion at Berkeley. Again, it just happened to be Cronut at the time. We didn't think it was um, a, a particularly special uh, event. Um, and uh, things went reasonably well. Uh, here's Cronut being set up on the, on the uh, underneath here, you see the, the, the white coil. We're using the four channel neck coil, a human neck coil. The reason for that is that we have to have something that's open at the back because we've got an intubation tube. He's, un he's under anesthesia. Uh, he's on an isofluorine gaseous anesthetic. And so in order to give all the access that the veterinary team needs to keep him under and breathing spontaneously, we need that access. The standard human head coils are shaped like a helmet and they're no good for, for this. So although the coil is not ideal, it's good enough. Um, and so we went with that. Uh, so here's the final picture before Cronut went slid into the magnet. He's being restrained by some nylon straps that you see here, just in case he has a seizure in the magnet or comes around for down the seizure. We don't want him to roll off the bed. Uh, he's all uh, made, uh, everything's taped up for, for security. We've got some green foam to keep his head still and also protect his hearing because the scanner's loud. And then there's also a black fiber optic cable here measuring the pulse oximetry the um, oxygen tension in his blood and the heart rate. So um, Cronut went into the scanner and this is what we saw on the right. So first of all, just to sort of reorient you, on the left is the scan that we uh, received from Redwood City in January. And then on the right is the Berkeley scan in October. So clearly something's changed. Let's first address the obvious uh, difference, which is the blurring. So, in January at Redwood City, the, the goal was ostensibly radiology. So it was a two dimensional scan with a relatively thick slice of about four millimeters and high in plane resolution of about half a millimeter. But by October, we were really thinking about Cronut as a test case for a scientific study. And so we really wanted um, three dimensional scans for quantitative uh, measurements of blood of brain structures like the hippocampus. So in that uh, case, we switched to a three-dimensional scan with one millimeter isotropic voxels. So you see that it looks blurrier because it's not as high resolution in plane, but it does give us the ability to slice arbitrarily uh, post hoc in these scans. And I think you can already probably see, because now you're experts at looking at the hippocampus and looking for asymmetries, that there was a problem. And you see now, um, that the left hippocampus is smaller than the right. Now here in these sl slides and in all other images I show you today, left is right, okay? So we always look at radiological coordinates, things are flipped over. It's the way that we look at the animal or the human as they're in the magnet, okay? So left is right. So this is his left hippocampus, clearly now smaller than the, than the right-hand side, there's some asymmetry. And this uh, dark region that you see around here this is actually fluid. This would be cerebral spinal fluid. The reason it appears dark is because we've nulled it. We've made the signal go away, specifically so we can look for anything else underneath. And we unfortunately do see this bright white rim around the, the, uh, the edge of the hippocampus, which is indicative of gliosis. That means that there's cell swelling or ongoing damage happening to this uh, hippocampus. So it's not just that it's shrunk in nine months, it's now continuing to shrink as of October 2018. So um, our, the veterinary radiologist, neuroradiologist on the team, Sophie Dennison, she read these scans and, and reported that we now have mild asymmetry and that the left hippocampus is, is atrophied. And that means that this was the diagnosis. This is what's left. This is what is diagnosed 
when all other causes have been ruled out and there is an MRI documentation of hippocampal atrophy. So um, this is a, a well-known condition in sea lions, as I'll show you in a sec. Um, and uh, so this was essentially the proof that unfortunately the reason for Cronut having misbehaved and probably stranding three or four times was because he'd been poisoned out at sea some uh, time earlier in his, in his life when he was probably a relatively young animal. So I want to just shift gears a little bit and look at the, um, the reason for this toxicity. And we're going to have to shift into ecology. So um, domoic acid is a specific type of neurotoxin that is produced in certain microalgae or phytoplankton that are in the classification diatoms. They're little tiny um, uh, cellular organisms that often form chains, very, very small. Uh, they, we don't know exactly at the moment why they produce demoic acid, uh, but we know a lot, a lot, awful lot about uh, when they do. And unfortunately, these uh, algae blooms tend to produce the, the toxin uh, demoic acid when there is a warming of the so uh, ocean surface temperature and abundant nutrients. So of course, this is an ongoing or uh, growing problem uh, with global warming. So uh, unfortunately, these, these kinds of uh, toxic algae blooms are a big and growing problem uh, uh, in, in the Pacific along our coast. Um, about 60 species known worldwide, about half of which have already been shown to produce domoic acid so far. And so here's the sort of the root of the problem, the crux of the problem. Uh, these little tiny phyto, uh, phytoplankton or microalgae are the base of the food web. They get eaten by the, the animal plankton and then anything that eats animal plankton, which would be all filter feeders, sardines, anchovies, baleen whales, and so on, are now exposed to this, uh, this compound, domoic acid. Now, interestingly, in most fish species, it doesn't seem to do them much harm, at least at the naturally occurring levels. But in mammals and birds, it is devastating, even at relatively low levels. Um, we used to have harmful algae blooms at about the rate of maybe once every five years, but in recent years, they've become almost uh, an annual occurrence, at least for the Pacific uh, coast. So um, let's look at this global problem for a sec, a quick detour into, uh, into some ecology. Uh, I'm just throwing up on the screen papers that have been published since 2013, documenting a harmful algae bloom producing domoic acid somewhere in the world. You'll see the, the, the names come up. It's every single ocean in the, in the world. Uh, it's particularly problem, problematic in the Pacific. It's in the Arctic, it's up into uh, Alaska. And it's also now even in the Antarctic. As of January this year, it's been documented even in Antarctic. So a truly global problem. Um, if we go back a sec to uh, the, the situation that we had around uh, up to 2012, you'll see that there's an awful lot of hotspots in testing around the Pacific coast in the UK, parts of New Zealand and uh, off of uh, southern Brazil. These are just areas, I think, where um, a lot of testing happens because there's a lot of commercial fishing. Interestingly, at the time that this slide was produced, down in Chilean Patagonia, there's a red dot for one of the toxic species of domoic acid of, of Pseudonitia, called Pseudonitia australis. But at the time, there was no documented evidence of domoic acid having being produced in that, uh, in that region, okay? Uh, it was really obviously a very big problem up in, in, along the Pacific coast of North America. We were having many, many problems. But at that point in Chile, nothing. And then this happened. Uh, in March of 2015, an aerial survey team started spotting dead whales in uh, the fjords of Patagonia. By the time they'd finished the survey, they counted 360. Of those, 348 were these massive say whales, third largest baleen whale, third largest animal on our planet, uh, truly massive animals. So 348 of these is just a staggering death toll, a massive amount of, of, of carnage. They conducted investigation that, that summer, came back the following summer uh, and got into the carcasses, did as much uh, um, histology and, uh, and ne uh, necro, what do they call it? Um, necrology or whatever they call it, uh, as, as they could. 
and produced this paper in 2017, uh, strongly suggesting that this entire mass, mass mortality event was due to domomic acid. So um, it's, a, it's a really a, a massive problem. Um, and it's not just sea lions that are gonna experience this. A more recent example uh, is uh, possibly the event that happened in Tasmania late last year, where 450 pilot whales stranded. Uh, these are actually a large species of dolphin, apparently, but um, a large number of them stranded, many died. It's a seasonal uh, problem, almost annual, very much like the sea lion strandings that we have in California. And in fact, even though uh, it's been documented in this paper, that suggested in 2017 that demoic acid may be the cause in Tasmania too, none of the coverage I saw mentioned it. So this is something for you guys to keep an eye on. Uh, if, it, if when it happens next year and maybe the year after, maybe eventually people will start testing for demoic acid. If we could get some post-mortem brains from these animals, we would probably be able to see if the hippocampal damage would indicate demoic acid toxicosis, just like in, in uh, Cronut's brain. Good, so that's the segue uh, for from ecology. Let's look at what was happening in our backyard um, and specifically to Cronut uh, in, during this event, which the media nicknamed the blob. I don't know if you remember this, but this was a big area of very uh, abnormally warm water, about two degrees Celsius above the normal temperature. It persisted for about 18 months. It finally dissipated in early 2016 with the, uh, with the creation of that, that year's El Nino. And um, through 2015 in particular, it really caused a, a big uh, problem for, uh, for harmful algae blooms. At its largest extent, I think this blob was about a thousand kilometers long, several hundred kilometers wide and about a hundred meters deep. This is uh, a satellite view of the amount of chlorophyll that was detected uh, in the ocean off our coast. And in the left-hand panel, bottom left, you see a big red hotspot in uh, the last week of March of 2015. Five weeks later, that hotspot has just exploded all the way up the Pacific coast. It's now way past the top end of Vancouver Island. Uh, and this was what uh, led to a big uh, stranding event, a big mass mortality event on our coast. How do we know it was demoric acid that was, or specifically Pseudonitia uh, algae that was causing this, this bloom? On the top panel, you see a survey site, data from a, a beach in Washington. And in green, you see uh, the amount of algae in seawater that was collected from the site. And in, uh, in pink, you see the amount of particulate demoric acid that they detected from that same sample. So you see a, a clear correlation. And there's this sudden spike starting in early May in Washington, coincident with this bloom arising uh, that we see in the satellite data. So this was part of the result. The Marine Mammal Center was inundated with especially very young pups, one-year-old pups. They were just color coding them. It was a big triage, a total mess. Some of the numbers are quite staggering. Um, these are the animals in red. If you draw a line perpendicular to where they come ashore, you can see how, how many were coming ashore in San Francisco and San Luis Obispo. Um, these are only the animals that had positive demoric acid uh, diagnosis, not all the animals. There were many other animals that would come ashore with shark bites and various other injuries, lacerations that they probably got as a result of having been exposed to demoric acid. It also affected a number of whales, porpoises, dolphins, and it absolutely devastated the shellfish and seafood industry along our coast that year. It had to be shut down because of the toxicity. So at this point, we should move into the animal and look at why this is a toxin at all. What makes uh, demoric acid a problem? Um, ordinarily, it wouldn't be a big problem, except these animals are swimming in it, literally, and they are eating fish that consume demoric acid all the time. So although the demoric acid is processed relatively quickly by the kidneys, it has a short half-life of a few hours. Um, if, if all you eat is poisoned fish, eventually it's going to get into your system. Uh, and eventually it will cross the blood brain barrier just across a concentration gradient. It's particularly dangerous, however, for young animals. Pregnant mothers um, are actually increasing the risk for their fetus because the demoric acid will concentrate in amniotic fluid. 
And then uh, if the blood brain barrier is, in, is immature, as it is in a fetus and even a young a newborn pup, then the domoic acid finds an easier route into the brain. So uh, this is uh, again, enhancing their risk. And finally, as if it wasn't bad enough, while the animal's nursing, yep, you guessed it, the mother's milk is also a vector for domoic acid. So if an algae bloom was relatively small in, in geographic area, or if it was relatively short lived, it probably wouldn't be a problem. But if we have a bloom that lasts for weeks or months and it covers hundreds or even thousands of square kilometers, then the animals just simply cannot forage in anywhere that is, is providing clean food. It's always poisoned food that they're eating. And this is where the, the, the chronic problems uh, really, really start for these animals. Um, if they did get a big dose, uh, an acute dose, it's normally fatal, causes paralysis, stops the breathing. So, um, the condition that we're particularly interested in, the one that causes epilepsy, is much more likely to be a chronic, low, uh, uh, slow uh, poisoning uh, condition. The animals that um, take a big dose of, of domoic acid probably become uh, shark and seagull food pretty quickly, unfortunately. Um, so why is this uh, a neurotoxin at all? What is it that makes this compound a neurotoxin? Um, and that I'm trying to display here on the right hand side. Hopefully you can immediately see that there are functional groups that are the same on the right, uh, that there are two carboxylic acid groups uh, in common in domoic acid, canic acid and glutamic acid. They all look very similar. In fact, canic acid and domoic acid are the same except for four extra carbons in the domoic acid backbone. Otherwise they're identical. Um, they have the same functional groups. And it turns out that um, domoate and, and canate are considered to be analogs of glutamate. And here's the key term. Glutamate is the most abundant excitatory neurotransmitter in our vertebrate central nervous system. So this key term is excitatory. This is what's giving rise to the, the problem of, um, of, um, of neurotoxicity and ultimately to, to epilepsy. So let's look at a synapse, this kinate synapse. Now, this is a bit busy, but bear with me. You have to imagine there's a neuron living somewhere above the screen and a neuron living somewhere below the screen. This is the junction between the two of them. So the neuron above the screen, when it depolarizes or fires, it sends an electrical signal down its axon, which is a myelinated cable that comes out of it. And then it creates these synapses to the next neurons down the, the, the chain in the circuit. So this is one of those links in the chain. So the neuron above the screen is fired, sends an electrical signal down to this point, and at the presynaptic, we call it the presynaptic uh, junction or presynaptic terminal, the electrical signal gets converted into a chemical signal. And this chemical signal gives rise to the name of the synapse. So this is a glutamatergic or excitatory synapse. It uses glutamate as the intrinsic endogenous signaling agent. And the glutamate is packaged in these little circles, we call these vesicles, and it is released into this cleft, this gap between the one neuron and the other neuron. So the other neuron, when it gets its hand off, when it gets its chemical signal, it does so by virtue of, of sensing how much glutamate is in the cleft. Now we give names to the receptors on the other side of this, the postsynaptic side, based on the affinity to compounds other than glutamate. So there's no kinate in this system, there's no NMDA in this system, but clever cell biologists have used these chemicals as markers to differentiate between the receptor types that we find on this postsynaptic side. So now I think you can probably uh, triangulate the problem. If I have something called a kinate receptor, that ind indicates that this particular receptor has an affinity for kinate as it does for glutamate. And in fact, uh, it has a 30-fold affinity for kinate. It would much rather bind to kinate than glutamate. And it gets even worse if we put domoate or domoic acid into the system. Overall, it's more than 100-fold uh, more sensitive to the domoic acid moiety than it is to glutamate. So if, uh, if domoic acid gets into the brain, if it gets into this synaptic transmission system, it will send this postsynaptic neuron into basically an overheated frenzy. It will cause a massive amount of calcium to be released. It will cause this runaway 
uh, firing to happen and the cell essentially will over, over excite itself and, and excite itself to death. It's what we call apoptosis. It's a pre-programmed response to, for this uh, cell to kill itself in order to try to save the rest of the animal or to save the, the rest of the brain. So um, this is the mechanism of toxicity for the, uh, the domoic acid moiety when it gets into the brain. So this is almost certainly what happened to Krona. We don't know uh, any firsthand what, what happened to him in 2014, 2015, but we know that he was swimming around eating uh, and, and while there was a toxic algae bloom going on in the Pacific coast. So there's a very good chance that that was when he was poisoned. He may have been poisoned repeatedly. He may have been uh, eating poisoned fish through 2014, 2015, and 2016. He may even have been exposed as a, as a, as a pup in 2013. We just don't know. Um, what we do know is that over 2019 and 2020, Cronut's seizures uh, got worse. Uh, they were relatively well controlled with medication, but he wasn't thriving. And in fact, uh, his weight, as late as September 2020, when he was a seven-year-old, was the same as when, he, when I scanned him in October 2018 as a five-year-old. Uh, bear in mind that, you know, as a five-year-old, he's sort of a late adolescent. As a seven-year-old, he's considered to be a breeding age adult male. Um, and breeding age, age adult male sea lions, they can get to 800 pounds. He's a quarter of that. He's essentially stunted. So this is really not a good sign. He really not, he's really not thriving. He's lethargic. Uh, and he's losing weight. And for somebody who's stranded overweight, for an animal to then lose, uh, to, to go more than two weeks, multiple times without eating, this must have been a really a distressing time for him. He was really doing uh, not, not at all well. Uh, so Claire was, Claire had taken, Claire Simeone had taken over from Vanessa Hord. She'd moved to San Diego. And so Vanessa, sorry, uh, Claire, had called me in early September and asked if we could do a scan on Krona because she was getting very worried. Um, of course, we were in the middle of a pandemic and uh, we weren't allowed to have, wasn't, well, the sea lions weren't the problem, the humans were the problem. We couldn't have the requisite team that we needed to come to the scanner to do a scan on Krona. So we were discussing in early September doing a repeat scan at Redwood City. Um, and then, of course, Cronut changed the equation on us and had a massive seizure to the point where one of his handlers, Diane Cameron, said that if they hadn't found him in time, he probably would have drowned in his pool. So it was a really a life and death situation. And at this point, the, uh, the discussion shifted to palliative care or something truly uh, revolutionary. So this again was where sort of um, a bit of uh, serendipity comes in. Um, Claire Simeone uh, is married to uh, Sean Johnson. They were both at one point at the Marine Mammal Center as vet veterinarians. And they were there when Scott Baraban had given a talk about an experimental treatment for epilepsy that he'd been developing in his lab some years ago. And they'd re remembered this. And so Claire got in touch with Scott and said, look, hey, I've got this animal. He's really not doing well. I really don't know what else to do. I'm prepared to consider anything. What do you think? And because Mariana had already been working on the pig cell line, they, would, they, they said, okay, we think we can get ready in time. We think we can be ready in a couple of weeks. Let's give it a go. So it went from maybe five or 10 years time to the week after next, we're gonna try and do this, this uh, therapy. Um, what is involved in this therapy? We're gonna inject these cells called medial ganglionic eminence cells. I'm gonna try and explain to you a little bit of, about where this comes from. So in the top left, this is the uh, development of a, of a rodent brain where E10 means, or E10.5 means it's embryo stage development, 10.5 days, and 11.5 days and 14.5 days. So it goes from a neural tube, which is literally a tube, to something that starts to differentiate into a brain. And about midpoint in the development of the brain, a structure is created called the ganglionic eminence. It only exists in the fetal brain. In the mature brain, it differentiates into other structures, the striatum and globus, global, globus pallidus and something else. But during the period of development, this is the foundry or the factory for interneurons that become or inhibitory neurons 
that go throughout the brain to essentially mediate the brain's behavior. So this is a very crucial period in brain development. These little green circles down here are designed to show a timeline of these neurons being created and then finding their way through the brain to wherever they're going to wire up and become permanent parts of the brain structure. This is also depicted on the right. So from the medial portion of the ganglionic eminence, these cells will migrate perpendicular to the evolving cortex, find a place to live, follow their genetic instructions, put down roots, and they will then live forever in the brain. They're particularly important neurons because they are the, moder the moderators or the, the choke for, uh, for the behavior of excitatory neurons. So although they're very small and they're very diffuse, there's not many of them compared to the number of excitatory cells, they have a, an outsized role to play in, uh, in the way that the brain uh, moderates its behavior, especially in the uh, expression of excitatory neurotransmitters. So uh, the idea is simply, simply this, uh, that you take cells from a fetal um, ganglionic eminence, uh, you culture them in a, in, in, a, in a dish, and then at some appropriate point, you inject them into a mature brain with the idea that these neurons will follow their pre-programmed course, find a place to live in the tissue that they've been injected into, put down roots, and go about their business of moderating the excitatory behavior. This is the, this is the plan. So this was the hope for, for Krona. The model had been tested in rodents, rodent to rodent, and I think they tried pig to rodent. This is the paper that they just published. So they've tried the, the pig cells. Um, I think they're 35 day old embryonic cells from the pig. And this is the hope for Krona. So the idea is to inject these cells into Krona's brain and try to uh, tamp down his epilepsy. So it went from uh, zero to a thousand miles an hour in very, very short order. Uh, we did play with the idea of trying to get a scan, an MRI scan before doing the surgery and then sending him to surgery straight away afterwards. But it became very quickly apparent that what we really needed was a CT scan, an X-ray CT scan. And the reason for that is that the neurosurgeons, here's John Andrews crouching down, holding a stereotactic frame, and clear, oh, hang on, the cat's just jumped on the desk, excuse me. There you go. Uh, Zoom bombed by the cat. So, um, so, the, uh, the, so Claire is shaving Cronut's head in order for John to be able to put this frame on and bolt it to Cronut's skull. Then when we put Cronut into the CT scanner, we get a picture that includes Cronut's skull and the stereotactic frame as a reference. Uh, so here is Crown up with the skull attached in the surgery, ready to go into the scanner, with the CT scanner. And here's the actual CT scan. I'm gonna zoom in on this screen. So now you can see that there's this constellation of dots. These are the fiducial markers that the software that will be used during surgery, it knows where those are. So these are the common reference to mate between Cronut's brain, uh, sorry, Cronut's skull and the uh, location of the stereotactic frame. So this is our common reference. And now there's only one thing missing. And the reason why we didn't do an MRI before the surgery, we decided to keep the, the MRI the same, is because essentially Cronut is the same size. So in a slightly lucky situation that Cronut's head was the same size in October 2018 as in October 2020, um, all the neurosurgeon needs to know is where their left hippocampus is. What's the target? The fact that the hippocampus may have atrophied further was not a prime concern, they just needed to know the coordinates. So, so we could skip the MRI, use my old MRI from 2018, fuse it to the new CT, and then we would have all of the information we would need to hit this target. This clever part of the procedure was done by Laura Krasovec. She works for Brain Lab, but she actually works in the UCSF neurosurgery department um, as, a, as an employee of Brain Lab. Um, and then once we've got all the referencing, then the, these progenitor cells can be injected into the correct place in, in um, Cronut's brain. This is not sea, sea lion, it's not Cronut, this is, um, this is human. It's the only example I could find. Uh, but this shows you how in blue, the CT scan picks up the skull. The MRI scan underneath shows the nice soft tissue contrast of the brain itself. And this is mated together. So we use the skull, uh, as, as a common reference to make these two together. And now there's only one piece missing, and that's to figure out where you are in, uh, in, in 
3D space with your instruments. So they have these clever instruments with reflective balls on, and the software knows how long the instrument is, where the tip of the needle is. It's all picked up by this camera, which integrates with the soft with the, um, the fused CT MRI data. And now it doesn't matter if I rotate or I translate, I rotate in 3D axis, I always know where the tip of the needle is. So this gives the neurosurgeon the ability to essentially fly uh, like a fly-by-wire system into the brain, even though they can't see, they can look at a screen and know where they are in, inside the head. So this is stereotactic neurosurgery. This is what happened uh, down in Redwood City. So now we can go back to the picture I showed you earlier, and you can see now uh, you recognize the stereotactic frame bolted to, to Cronut's skull. Uh, this is not one of the um, stereotactic instruments. I believe it's a drill. I think they are, I think John's doing an incision doing a, a borehole through Cronut's uh, uh, um, skull, or and maybe he's, he might actually be doing the final, I think maybe mating the final bolt of the, of the, uh, of the stereotactic frame, I can't actually remember. Anyway, um, but now you see the parts and you can sort of see the, the logic here uh, that, that goes into this. Um, and it was all pretty much done in a, in a pinch with, uh, with make do good enough uh, instruments transported down to Redwood City. This is in a, uh, a veterinary operating theater, not a human neurosurgery uh, theater at UCSF. Um, so good, uh, the surgery went well. It took a long time. It was out for over four hours, I think nearly five hours. So the recovery was slow. That's an awful lot of anesthesia uh, to recover from. He had some wounds. You know, he had the, the, the bolt holes in his skull and that, that those needed to heal. So he was kept away from his pool. Uh, that meant that he was a little distressed for a while. He had a bit of a fever for a day or two. But once they uh, got him back in his pool, uh, he was pretty happy. He went back to eating, but he required feeding by hand. He likes human company. So uh, he kind of played it. I think he played it up a little bit. Um, his cyclosporin levels were sort of guesstimates, uh, never been done before in a um, in a, a sea lion, cyclosporin is an immune suppressant designed to stop the cells from being rejected by or, or attacked by Cronut's immune system. So uh, th he's still on cyclosporin today, but uh, they're hoping to wean him off of it. So this is an important part of any trans transplant surgery, whether it's heart, lung, kidney, or cells, uh, in order to stop the an immune response. Um, and it needs to happen in this case for at least about 30 or 40 days, because it takes about that long for these progenitor cells to find their forever home, put down their roots, wire up, and, uh, and, and then do what we hope them to do. Good, so that was the surgery. We recovered well from the surgery. I'm sure you wanna know. Well, great. So what, what happened? How's he doing? Um, this is a tweet that uh, Scott Baraban put out a couple of weeks ago. He's now approaching six months uh, post-transplant, completely seizure-free. Amazingly seizure free. This is the report that uh, Claire sent the team um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, seizure free. He's she, she's thrilled with his recovery. He's still having some of his quirks. Still likes to be fed by hand. I'm sure he likes to have his belly rubbed too. Hey, who doesn't? Um, but it's not something that's disturbing her. He seems to be thriving again. He seems to be pretty happy uh, and the usual sort of quirky crone up that that the animal uh, the keepers had managed to. So get to know before he had these issues. He's still on some anti-convulsant drugs, but they're starting to wean those off, trying to get rid of the cyclosporin. Again, it's a first, so it's all an experiment, but he's seizure free and he's not on seizure medi medication, which is super important. It means that essentially we can claim that the surgery really did work as intended. I think it uh, meets or exceeds everybody's best expectations, which is pretty stunning. So, um, now what? Uh, this is the story so far. This is a, an evolving story. Um, we're perhaps at the end of Act 1, maybe beginning of Act 2. Um, if we do get to do a scan on Cronut this summer, what would we hope to see? We will not see regrowth of Cronut's hippocampus. The part that died, that atrophied away, will not come back. This is not Cronut. This is an, an animal called Stern, sea, sea lion Stern. We scanned him in 2019. Um, but the method that I'm showing you here is the same basic method that Nina Dronkers talked about last week. This is mapping the fibers, the connective fibers, the white matter 
uh, myelinated fibers of the brain that connect the neurons together in the brain. The, um, the, the major tracts of the brain that need to talk to each other very rapidly and frequently. So what we might hope to see is some mapping of the hippocampus that is functionally useful uh, and maybe uh, perhaps um, see recovery of that uh, structure over time, assuming that Cronut continues to thrive, and maybe we can scan him next year and the year after. So what might that look like? Um, here's C. Lion Stern's uh, tractography. In gray are all the major fibers, and in white, uh, sorry, in red, we've selected just the fibers that pass through either left or right hippocampus. And you see clearly again, left is right. So the left hippocampus just doesn't have the same number of connections to the rest of the brain that the right does. It's because Stern also had demyric acid toxicosis and an atrophied hippocampus. And so essentially this is probably what we would have seen with Cronut if we uh, process his data. We do have some data from Cronut. We just haven't had a chance to look at it yet. So um, this would be the hope. And the, the idea would be that if we scan Cronut serially over the next two or three years, we would hope to see the density of the red fibers that going through his hippocampus, his left hippocampus, would increase. There's a precedent for this recovery or for this growth uh, in humans, actually, in uh, people who are trained to, to become London taxicab drivers. They have to learn the streets of London by heart, but from memory. And they actually do see hippocampal growth and extra uh, connections from their, from their hippocampus. So we would expect to see the same kind of thing in, in Cronut. It may require a particular type of training regimen. We may need to do some sort of rich environment, some task for him where he, he has to find fish or remember where fish are, are being hidden. But uh, this is something that, that the team, I'm sure, will start to discuss this summer once it's quite clear that Cronut's life is no longer in danger and he's likely to to thrive indefinitely now. So um, let's summarize. Um, this, this little fella, Cronut, is quite the pioneer. Um, in addition to being the first sea lion scanned at Berkeley, uh, and the, also the first sea lion to receive cyclosporin, I think he was the first malingering sea lion to break his way into, the, uh, into human care, lucky, lucky man. He did have uh, the brain fiber mapping that I just showed you. We just haven't processed those data yet mainly because they were experimental data. They weren't designed to be used when we, when we scanned him. Uh, they're pretty rough data, but given how important Cronut now is, I think it's really appropriate for us to, to pull those data out and look at them. Um, he's the first uh, sea lion, in fact, the first pinniped to have his cerebral blood flow maps using MRI. And I've shown you an example there at the bottom. Not, don't have time today to talk about these data, but this is also going to be useful for longitudinal studies. And also we hope perhaps to be able to replace the rather gross uh, diagnostics that we use for with uh, anatomical MRI. We would hope perhaps to get a better view of epilepsy in sea lions by using a slightly more physiological map. So this is something for the future. And of course, uh, this is the very first animal that re received uh, this, this trans transplant animal of any kind. So truly a pioneering animal. I think uh, Cronut is going to be a very famous animal. He's already pretty famous. I think he's going to possibly have a role like uh, some of our more famous human patients like HM. I think he's really going to have a, a really outsized effect on neuroscience and neurosurgery uh, going forward. He's really a, a massive pioneer. Um, so a huge number of people made this happen. These are just the principal players who really made things happen that was specific to Cronut, this particular story. Not included on this slide are the dozen or 15 other people who are associated with the Sea Lion Project who are uh, involved in other aspects, not necessarily directly related to Cronut or Cronut surgery. So apologies for leaving those, those guys out. Um, Claire has been immense. Claire, Claire Simeone has been huge. Uh, and Mariana Casalia, deserves just an immense amount of credit for having the precinct, uh, uh, the insight to prepare for, a, um, for, for a, a surgery that may never have happened. Um, so, but she was ready to go. When the call came, she was already ready to go. It's st staggering stuff. Very impressive from the Baraban lab. Um, I think I have one more slide. Yeah, good. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed this and you find it fascinating. If you did, 
let us know. Also follow Krona on Twitter because hey, 2021. Um, Mark and I are trying to get projects like this going through Wheeler Labs. Uh, this is a kind of a weird project. It doesn't really fit in anybody's uh, existing funding structure. So everybody, this is a coalition of the willing. Everybody's just taking what they can, saying yes, rolling up our sleeves and getting going. But at some point we are going to need to start to find some funding for this. And it's not yet clear whether we have an angle through NIH or NSF, NOAA or any of the other federal agencies because this spans so many different disciplines. You can couch it as ecology or marine mammal biology or neurosurgery. So we've really got to think this through. We are very interested though, if anybody is interested in funding something philanthropic, philanthropically, please do get in touch. Uh, for those of you who have grandkids looking for something to do this summer, uh, I would encourage you to check out the Marine Mammal Center's website, look for the virtual tours this summer. And this, uh, the organization at the bottom, Sea Change Health, this is Claire's new uh, nonprofit. So she's doing lots of outreach and workshops right now. Super cool stuff. I would encourage you to check that out. Um, and then, yep, uh, email Mark or myself. To definitely check out the Wheeler Labs website. There's lots of other weird, wonderful projects going on that you might find interesting that has nothing to do with sea lions, but might be interesting to you for other reasons. They're all brain related. That's about the only common thread. Um, and I think with that, uh, that's that's enough. I'll uh, I'll turn it back over to Donald and try and do my best to answer your question. Thank you very much, Ben. That was that was really fascinating. Uh, all right, we see a couple of questions have come in so far, and I encourage people to um, type into the chat for now. Uh, we'll handle those first. Later on, uh, we'll have um, an opportunity for people to ask things um, uh, orally if they. Uh, Aren't able or aren't willing to use Great. the chat. Uh, so let me. Uh, so let me first ask myself. Uh, so where? So he's at the Marine Mammal Center now, or does he? Does he? Is he ever going back to Vallejo? Or no, no, that's where he lives. He's, he, he lives, lives in there forever now. Um, so the way it works with marine mammals is that they're protected by the Marine Mammal Act. And uh, if you think human restrictions are tough, <laughs> you've got to check out the Marine Mammal Act. Um, luckily, one of the people on our team is. Um, is um, a marine mammal commissioner, Frances Gouland. She's at UC Davis now. Until about three years ago, she was the director of uh, science at, of, of research at the Marine Mammal Center. So she's been advising us. Um, but essentially, once you adopt a marine mammal, it's yours for the rest of its life. They're very expensive. Uh, people don't take this lightly, but he will be a Six Flags, um, a pet essentially for the rest of his life. Uh, so do, do they have many uh, adopted animals as opposed to the performers or, or they're just... Are they... I don't know. I've never actually even been out there. Um, I think they have several sea lions and I do believe most of them are rescues. There, there may well be uh, a couple of captive bred pups there, but um, I believe most of these animals are rescues of one kind or another. Right. It's kind of how the system works as I understand it. I think the marine parks really do play that, that role as Con con contentious as they are, mm -hmm. their existence, um, they do all have uh, this, um, this sort of hospital long-term care role um, because there is no other organization capable of, of taking this on. The Marine Mammal Center is strictly a hospital. If they don't get discharged and sent back to the wild or adopted, I'm afraid there's only one other outcome for the animals that go into the Marine Mammal Center. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, start with the questions then. Uh, Susan Pierpont, uh, if the poison sea lions become shark food with large doses, does that then affect the sharks? Yeah, good question. Um, I don't know. Um, and the evidence that I've seen suggests that fish species are um, susceptible to domoic acid at certain levels, but apparently not at the level that um, that is naturally occurring, at least the current naturally occurring level. So they seem to be able to get away with it. Maybe it's a quirk of their digestive system or, or their, um, maybe it's their differing um, nervous system, but it doesn't seem to affect fish species like it does mammals and birds. Um, uh, Susan Amato asks, since there are so many marine mammals affected by demoic acid, uh, and the cronut procedure is so complex, how can these other animals be helped? <laughs> that may not be. Yeah, really, really big question. And, and even for cronut, you know, even if we were to do this surgery 
on other sea lions, they would then still have to have a place to go. So uh, the idea, I think, of treating animals that are coming into the Marine Mammal Centre is probably not realistic. There are, however, because this has been a problem for a couple of decades, it's been a known problem for a couple of decades, there are a number of sea lions currently in captivity who also have epilepsy. So when this surgery was announced, when the, when the New York Times article came out, I know that Scott was contacted by at least two different groups begging him to send the team down to their facility to do their animals. So I think that's probably more likely. But after that, I don't know what happened. All right. Um, yes, Dorothy Gordon had a question. It also occurred to me. Um, are the porcine stem cells transformed into the recipient's DNA structure once they are integrated? Or, or um, do they no longer have a threat from being rejected? Once yeah, the, awesome question. I, I have, right, I have that question for Scott too. Um, as I understand cell biology, not a cell biologist, they would still have their own DNA. I don't think that's ever replaced. So, because the nucleus is not replaced. So I think they would remain porcine cells. Um, I think that's the central question on withdrawing the cyclosporin. The question I suppose is whether the, there's a, there, there will be a recognition of these being invasive cells. If so, then I guess he may be on cyclosporin forever. Mm -hmm. um, Will this uh, research have, uh, Gary Stover asked, will this research have benefits for humans with some type of epilepsy? Ah, that's the NIH question, right. So uh, one of our collaborators, Paul Buckmaster from Stanford, um, proposed sea lions with demoic acid toxicosis as a naturally occurring model for human temporal lobe epilepsy in 2014. Um, and we've actually been discussing this recently. Um, I've been discussing this with there was a panel in January at NIH. They have a, every, every seven years, they have a panel that gets together to discuss priorities for epilepsy. They discussed this at that panel, uh, whether it would be a suitable model. I have some reservations. Um, part of it is access, right? These animals live on the left coast. So what do you do if you're in Boston or if you're in you know middle of the country? They're also super expensive. The logistics is very, very complicated. They live for 20 or 30 years. I just don't see this as being a, a common model for human temp temporal lobe epilepsy, but I think there are things that we can learn. So separate from this, this is why we're interested in looking at a longitudinal study of pups. We know that many of these pups are exposed in utero to demoic acid. What we'd like to do is use them as a model of essentially kids between about two and 16 years old, the equivalent of humans two and 16, and look to see what happens in the sequelae as epilepsy develops, because in humans, in, with kids, we don't generally have the before picture. We have when they have symptoms and then they go to get the MRI and then they're diagnosed with epilepsy. It would be awesome in sea lions if we could get some longitudinal data and see what's happening in the brain with EEG and MRI prior to them uh, expressing seizures and becoming epileptic. So that would be the hope, I think, more than this surgery. This surgery is kind of a, a bonus. Okay. Uh Another question from uh, Susan Amato. Um, HM had epilepsy and part of his brain was removed. Would this procedure have worked on Cronut? Was the yeah. porcine cell replacement less injurious because HM couldn't remember short-term events? Yeah, that's very much dependent, on, 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 as I understand it, on the, 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 the locus of the epileptic activity. So what we didn't do here with Cronut is to do an EEG or some other way of trying to localize the spiking activity. We, the assumption is, with these demoic acid cases, that the origin of the epilepsy is the atrophied hippocampus. So if we can fix the hippocampus, then we fix the problem. With humans in temp with temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, that isn't necessarily the case. There are many reasons why you might develop epilepsy, uh, maybe from as a result of a tumor, or maybe something genetic. So um, the approach would need to be different depending on the, the etiology um, of, of the disease. I think you also really need a an electrophysiological me um, measure first to know what you're dealing with before you would be able to answer that question robustly. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any more in the chat at the moment. Um, so at this point, I guess we can open it up uh, for anybody to, um, uh, Camille will uh, uh, unmute everybody or allow you to unmute yourself. So if you have a question you wanna ask orally, 
please uh, unmute yourself and uh, speak up. Uh, meanwhile, I did get a question of, does Cronaut have a website? <laughs> no, I think only, uh, only Twitter. I don't think he has Instagram either, sorry. <laughs> but maybe I'll work on that. That's a good idea. If we should have an update page. I think that's a good idea. I'll, I'll drop that, that idea into Claire's ear so she can have a, a page at Sea Change Health. All right. Um, and there's a question of whether the slides and presentation, presentation will be available. Yes, the recording has been made. It will take a, a little while, but it will eventually appear on the uh, YouTube channel uh, uh, for the Retirement Center. Um, yeah, and anybody's entitled, you know, please, please do email me offline and I'll do my best to get you pictures and put you in touch with people. If you're specifically interested in either you know, the ecology or the surgery, I can point you in the direction of the appropriate people. Looks like we have a question from Dick Holmquist. Yes, Ben, first of yeah. all, I want to congratulate you on an exceedingly clear and personable presentation of a complex subject. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much. My question to you, during the presentation, you mentioned that you were weaning uh, Cronut off of cyclosporine. And then during the chat, just a few moments ago, you mentioned that he may be on cyclosporine for life. If he is off of cyclosporine, won't his immune system destroy the cells you've injected and in, make it impossible for you to judge the efficacy of the treatment. Right, that's an ongoing discussion is happening you know, literally as we speak. Um, so I know that Claire and Scott are debating what they think they should do. I think they would like to try to wean him off. I think they've reduced the dose and I think they're happy with the amount that he's on. Um, they're, they're, they're now not worried about the cells uh, dying, though they will have integrated. Um, I suspect they will have to go based on what they've learned from pig cells in rodent models and make a judgment. It's going to be a bit of a guess. And they in know, rodent models, the, the cells live on? That I don't know. I, I, don't, I honestly don't know. I don't know that even that they've studied it long enough to know. I don't think they've ever had to address the question. So they may well be doing the experiment right now in a, in a rodent colony so, so that we could determine the question empirically. And um, in the seal. You know. Yeah, right. Um, and I guess at some point, you know, this is also um, not necessarily a scientific decision. You know, Cronut has, uh, you know, his, 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 his carer mum, Diane Cameron and the Six Flags team, and they also have to make a decision. If they decide it's psychosporin forever and no more MRIs, that, okay, that's the decision. You know, it's about Cronut. Um, if we get to study him again, great, but it's really about his quality of life and making sure that that he thrives at this point. So no, I'm glad you made that. But it's truly an ethical decision as well as a scientific one. Correct, mostly ethical. Yeah, yeah. Scientific. We we will debate the science, um, and it may be able to inform the ethic ethics. But I think if there's any significant risk, they will probably not risk it. Do those regulatory restrictions on animal studies that you mentioned cover the ethics? <laughs> they are way more stringent than we can do in humans. So uh, why wouldn't we use this as a, as a model for human uh, epilepsy, uh, propose it to the NIH? Because we can't even do on a sea lion today what we can do on a human as standard medical practice. So but do those regulations allow you to withdraw the cyclosporine from? Uh, so I, don't think anyone, I don't think anyone has, uh, there's, there's no precedent for that, but we certainly can't do anything, uh, proceed, anything, any procedure that is, done on these animals, any decision that's made has to be with their health care in mind. It can't be done for any other reason. No scientific reason satisfies the requirements. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Terry Machen has asked whether it would be reasonable to use domoic acid fed pigs as a model for this uh, surgical correction. Sure. Uh, yes, would be the answer if that was had the characteristics of the model that you were looking for. If, for example, you were interested in a pig-to-pig -pig, um, transplant of cells. Right now, uh, rodents are the preferred species, and there are some people, unfortunately, using primate models, even though we try not to use those models. There's a lot of logistics and ethical concerns. But, um, you know, at some point, if you try to get into animal models, in, you have to sort of take a leap into higher, into, into 
something that's going to make people question whether the risks are worth it, whether the ethics are worth it. Pigs are used for a lot of different things now. So yes, they may well be. And there are mini pigs too, very convenient for experiments, uh, easier logistics for keeping. So yeah, mini pigs would probably be a good, a good model. If, if we had been in the auditorium as usual, you would have had a very good round of applause at the end of your talk, and we'd give you another one now, Ben. But Thank you. Thank it just you. doesn't work for this. So, I mean, you wouldn't have had really my cat great, It's great that we can do anything under this, <laughs> these circumstances, and Zoom is, is helpful that way, but yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really lacking in that proper That's response. Okay. Um, so uh, for the audience, I'd like to remind you that we do have uh, one more series of lectures uh, coming up in April. On Monument to Memory starts April 6th, followed by another one on the 12th and the third on the 20th. And then in uh, May, we have a one-off lecture, the first Carol D'Onofrio Memorial Lecture, um, or LIR Lecture, uh, which is going to be about um, uh, sort of a, uh, well, a, a in, in progress post postmortem on the, on the uh, COVID crisis and uh, public health and, um, and, and inequities issues around that uh, from John Swartzberg. Uh, so do look, for, uh, do look out for those and re register if you're interested. So otherwise, uh, that's the uh, end for today.